All right, welcome back. I hope you all have time to get yourself a beer and turn in your trivia sheets if you haven't already. All right, let's get started with our next speaker. You already heard from her tonight. Give it up for Dr. Jamie Lomax. <laughs> mostly a massive star person. That's what I study, if that's any better to know the time. Um, but I also do uh, things called prototype planetary and debris disks. Uh, but but um, when I study massive stars, I, it's almost always through polarimetry. So tonight I'm going to show you um, one uh, data set that I have on a massive star um, using polarimetry um, sort of at the end of the talk. But at first I thought you guys might not exactly know what a massive star is. So I should explain that to begin with. Um, and the easiest way to explain that is actually maybe through supernovae. Um, so if you guys have come to Astronomy on Top before, I think you have probably um, heard about the different types of supernova that, that go off. Um, we typically classify them um, to the first order based on whether or not they have hydrogen in their spectrum. And then we further subclassify them based on whether or not we see certain elements. So a type 1b supernova has no silicon, a type 1c has no silicon and also no helium. Um, we also classify them based on how their light curves, or how the, how the amount of light changes over time, what the light curve is, how their light curve evolves, um, and things like that. The weird thing about this is, um, maybe it's good for putting things into bins, but it doesn't really tell us what kinds of things exploded. Um, and so you can see I've color coded these lines um, and, oops, uh, and these types of these types of supernova. So the red supernova um, are from a thermonuclear reaction. Um, those are something different and I'm not going to talk about them. Um, but everything that's a massive star is going to explode as some other type of supernova. Every massive star ends its life as a supernova and it ends its life as what we call a core collapse supernova. You need, um, if you're a star, between about eight and 10 times the mass of our sun to do that. And so basically everything from there on up, uh, 90 times the mass of our sun, all of that, is going to explode as a supernova. So the holy grail for us in massive star research is basically to be able to take a massive star at the beginning of its lifetime, figure out how massive it is. Is it eight solar masses? Is it 15? Is it 50? Is it 100? and map out what its life is going to look like and figure out what supernova it's going to end its life as. So we would like to be able to say that something between 30 and 40 solar masses starts off as an O type star. O just basically means really, really big. Um, then becomes maybe uh, LBV. LBV stands for luminous blue variable. Um, they are literally luminous and they are literally blue and that's about all we know about them. We call things like we see it. We're, we, we, we're not very imaginative when it comes to names. Um, and then maybe it becomes a wolf ray star. So the WN stands for nitrogen rich wolf ray star. Um, and then maybe it explodes as some type of supernova. Um, and then we would like to be able to do the same thing for another mass spin and have it go through different states and stuff like that. Um, but it turns out that is really hard and it's complicated by the fact that most massive stars are probably in binary systems. Um, and so this is just a pie chart to show you where they would fall. Um, basically about one third of all massive stars are either actually single stars off on their own or they have a companion star that's orbiting so far away from it that it's never gonna interact with it and it's gonna just act like it's single, right? It's just not very friendly with the thing that's orbiting around it. But the other two thirds of massive stars um, have companions and they're either gonna merge with their companion star and make another even bigger star, or they're gonna interact by like saying, I wanna lose some weight, I'm gonna dump a bunch of my mass onto you and make you fat and heavier. Um, they do that. And in fact, the star that, what, what I'm gonna talk about later on is doing that. It's, it's super mean to its, its life partner. Um, they can also, they can also, like. <laughs> That's my husband. Um, they, they also uh, can accrete material from the companion. And what, what happens when, when they accrete material and gain material is they spin up and they spin faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And so it's like, 
having a friend at the Disney teacup ride, um, and then they spin you so fast that you start to throw up. The star will actually, the stars will actually start to spin so fast that they actually start to lose material and it goes everywhere. <laughs> Um, so if two-thirds of all stars, or all massive stars, are binaries, then two-thirds of all supernova, at least core collapse supernova, everything but the type 1As that we see should be coming from binary stars, right? That makes sense? Um, well, uh, there's a problem, and that is we've only seen maybe like two or three core collapse supernova where we have evidence that suggests that it's come from a binary star. So this is Supernova 1993J. Um, this is the explosion discovery image. You can see the supernova right here. It, it basically rivals the brightness of the galaxy that it's in. Um, and the reason, or at least one of the reasons we think that it was in a binary system was because several years later, a team went back and it imaged the same galaxy with Hubble. And they basically zoomed into that same region of the galaxy and then zoomed in some more and there's still a star there. And so we think that was the companion that did not get destroyed when the uh, original supernova went off, when its companion supernova, the companion star went, went off, right? So that's nice, except that like we should have more than one or two examples of this happening. We should have like tens of thousands of, of these happening. So why don't we uh, have, why, why don't we see that? Why don't we see all of these binary stars um, going supernova? Um, the answer is really that we don't know. We don't know how binary stars evolve. Um, and so we kind of have a general picture, which I'm going to give you now, um, but the details of this picture are really, really uncertain. So basically what happens is you start off your life if you're a binary star with a companion, they're orbiting each other, everything is fine and dandy, until the star that's the most massive star runs out of hydrogen. The most massive star is going to run out of hydrogen first. And when that happens, the star gets bigger and starts to puff up. And if the star fills a region around it called its Roche lobe, which is this teardrop-shaped thing, if it can push material beyond that Roche lobe, that material is no longer bound gravitationally to the star, and it can move around. And so this is where it gets mean, and it's like, I want to lose some weight, and all of that material that it pushes out here uh, transfers over to the companion, and then the companion starts gaining material um, and becoming more massive. And so then eventually that star should explode as a supernova, then we should have some sort of remnant, either a black hole or a neutron star. But then that secondary star that hasn't really evolved yet, that gained a bunch of mass, um, is going to do the same thing. It might fill its Roche lobe. It might say, you know what, you made me gain weight before. I'm going to make you gain weight now because I can. Um, that will evolve eventually into a, super, a supernova as well. And then you have two neutron stars or two black holes or a neutron star and a black hole orbiting each other that then coalesce. Um, and then you get the LIGO signature that you've seen if you've come to a, a previous astronomy on top where they showed you that. What's the WR? Uh, WR stands for, for Wolf Rayet, and those are stars that lack hydrogen, uh, which is interesting because about 75% of the stars should be hydrogen, and so they are just so big that they have either been able to blow off with their stellar winds all of their outer layers of hydrogen, or if they're in a binary system, they use this Roche lobe overflow to just dump all of their hydrogen onto their companion star. So the star I'm going to talk to you tonight uh, about is called Beta Lyra. This is a movie of the two stars orbiting each other. Um, it's a massive star system. And so what we can do with Beta Lyra is we can try to hammer out the details of how that mass is transferring between the two stars and when um, the system is losing material to try to figure out how that affects its future evolution. And once we kind of start answering questions like that, we can start to tease out why aren't we seeing all of these binary um, supernova progenitors that we think we should be seeing. What is its revolution? Uh, good question. I was just going to get to that. Um, so every 14 days, the two stars eclipse each other and, and um, go around. Um, the really cool thing about Beta Lyra is not only does this happen every 14 days, but you could go out tonight if you wanted to and find it. So this is the constellation Lyra. It is basically a triangle on top of a parallelogram. Um, if, if you guys know uh, 
uh, know your stars very well. This one up here is Vega. It's the brightest star in the constellation. And then this one down here is Beta Lyra. Um, and it's Beta literally because it's the second brightest. That's how it was named. Um, so it's roughly like right above us if it's not cloudy and rainy right now. Um, and if you have an app, if you, or if you want to download one of the apps that you can hold up and see what's in the sky and have it um, tell you what you're looking at, sometimes those apps um, call it Sheliac instead of Beta Lyra. So that's what you're looking for. But because you can see this with your naked eye, and because the two stars are orbiting each other and eclipsing each other every 13-ish uh, days, if you went outside every single night for the next 13 days, you'll actually notice that it's getting brighter and dimmer compared to the stars around it. So you can go and look at this and do this tonight. Um, and of course the sky doesn't have the lines nicely drawn on for you. So, so really quickly, good luck. <laughs> it's this guy. That's what you're looking for. This is the parallelogram here. And then this is the triangle. And this is the brightest one. Okay. So, okay. So what do we actually know about Beta Lyra besides that? Like, we can go and see it, and it's really cool. Um, and there's two stars that orbit each other. Um, both stars in the system were originally massive stars. Uh, the more massive star evolved first and filled its Roche lobe um, and is now actively losing material to the secondary star. Yeah. And in fact, it's lost so much material, it's not really a massive star anymore. It's only about three solar masses. And if you remember before, I told you massive stars are like sort of eight to ten or above. Um, so it's now a, a wee small star instead. Um, that mass loss and transfer to the companion star has formed a very, very thick accretion disk around it of gas. Um, and in fact, it's so thick that when we look at the star, um, we don't actually, when we look at the two stars, we don't actually see the star itself. And actually what you were seeing in that movie earlier was one star and one disk orbiting each other. You weren't actually seeing the secondary star. Um, it's just the light cannot get through that gas. It's just so uh, thick. We also know, or at least we have some evidence for jets coming out of the system. Um, but as you can see in that movie, you didn't see any evidence of jets. You just saw sort of two blobs orbiting each other. Um, so we don't really know exactly where the jets are. Um, if they're located on the edge of the disk like somebody uh, drew and depicted here, or if they're located more from the center due to um, infall of material onto the star and then it being flung up. That kind of thing. But polarimetry can really help us answer some of these questions. So basically, these are all features that we can't really see well with a regular telescope. We can't see the mass transfer stream between the two stars. We can't see the jets. But what we really want to know is how much material is moving between the two stars. We want to know if that transfer is kind of constant over time, or if it's clumpy and happening um, in bursts of, of mass loss and transfer. Um, and we want to know the same thing about the jets. Are they constant? Um, is a constant mass loss? What, how, how much material is being lost in the jets compared to how much is being transferred? So is the whole system losing mass as well, or is it just uh, the transfer happening? Those kinds of questions. So the key with Beta Lyra to understanding it with with the polarimetric data that I'm going to show you is this slide, um, and I'm going to explain it to you. So basically, if you have a star like this orange blob here, that's obviously very star-like, surrounded by uh, something gas or dust that is circularly symmetric, what happens is the light comes out of the star unpolarized, it interacts, magic happens, and all of those wiggles of the light line up so that they're tangential to the edge of the, the gas and dust. And then if you go and look at that with a telescope, remember we're not actually resolving this. We're using polarimetry as a trick to get us geometric information without ever having to resolve it. But so if you go and look at it with a telescope, basically you see all of these lines all together, and you see all of the wiggles in all of their directions, and it looks like it's not polarized, and so you don't get any, you don't actually get any polarimetric signal. But if the gas around your star is elongated in some way and disc-like, like maybe the disc that's in Beta Lyra, then your, your light still interacts it with the same way. It still um, the, gets scattered so that the 
uh, wiggles are preferentially uh, tangential to the edge of, of the gas. But when you add them all up to look at it with a telescope, they no longer are all in one direction. There's a little bit of a preferred direction. It's like they, they cancel with each other a little bit, but not all the way, so you get a preferred direction. And that preferred wiggle direction is 90 degrees from the direction of the elongation of the disk. So you can back out geometric information pretty quickly. So um, what I'm showing you now is a polarimetric light curve of Beta Lyra. So if you've come to astronomy on top before, you've seen light curves of planets as they transit in front of stars. This is basically the same thing, but with just a little extra information. So this top panel here is the regular light curve of Beta Lyra. So uh, if you look at the system at this time, at day zero, um, it doesn't have a lot of light coming from it. And that's because the star in the system that's losing material is directly behind the disk. And then the system rotates a little bit um, so that they're next to each other. And then it rotates a little bit more. And then the star is in front of the disk. And so you have a little bit more light than you did at primary eclipse, um, but less light than you did when you uh, when the two stars were next to each other, the disk and the star were next to each other. And then it continues to rotate until you're back at a primary eclipse again. And again, this happens every 13 days. Um, when you look at this with polarimetry, you basically get the same thing. You get a polarized light curve, which means you also get how much light was polarized over time, just like you had uh, how much light you were getting over time. You just it's just how much light was totally polarized. And you also get the direction of that polarization with time. So I'm going to walk you through what this graph um, is actually telling us and teaching us about Beta Lyra. Um, and I want you to forget the top two panels for the time beam. I will come back to them. And I'm only going to talk about the angle that the light is wiggling in. And in fact, I'm actually going to ask you also to forget about this for a few slides. Because <laughs> Right, that's weird. It doesn't look like everything else. Um, uh, everything else looks nice and neat, right? It's, it's kind of all nice and aligned there. And in fact, if you draw a line through there, um, that angle, um, if you can see the different angles here, that angle is at about 164 degrees. And so, like I said before, that the angle that the light is wiggling at is 90 degrees off of the angle that the disk is at. So if you just add 90 degrees to that, you get 256 degrees. And if you guys can see it, if, if nobody's head is in your way, that's what this angle is right here compared to the constellation. Right? So this is the constellation. This is the, the, um, the parallelogram. The, the orientation of the disk in the system is like this. So, right, so directly, just by looking at how the light is wiggling, I can tell you how the disk is oriented on the sky, which is pretty cool um, and pretty useful information. And in fact, if you go back to the movie that I showed you of the two blobs orbiting each other, and you figure out what the angle is from the two blobs, you get roughly the same number. It's, it's 253 degrees compared to 256. So we're doing pretty good. Um, and, and I should mention that this movie actually took multiple telescopes observing um, Beta Lyra at the same exact time to be able to see the two stars separated from each other. Normally you don't get to do that. That's a pretty difficult thing to do. Um, and so we're getting that information with a very small telescope without ever having to, you know, do more complicated things. Uh, so still, still forget about this for a little while. So, so what is the other, what is what is this other uh, middle graph that I was showing you? What does that tell us? Well, it tells us a few things. There's actually three features in here that are important. And the first thing is that primary eclipse, when the disk is in front of the star that's losing material, you'll see that the amount of polarized light that we're getting has increased compared to other, other times during the star's orbits. And basically what, what this graph is, is actually not the amount of, of polarized light we're getting, it's the amount of polarized light we're getting compared to the total amount of light we're getting, right? So there's an unpolarized light source in our system, which is the primary star that's the one that's losing all the material. And then there's a source of polarized light in the system, which is the, the disk, right? And so what's happened is the disk is blocking out our unpolarized light source. So 
we don't have, we're not seeing that anymore. So percentage-wise of the total light that we're getting, we're getting percentage-wise more polarized light, even though if you were to measure the intensity, it's the same as when, um, as when the, the primary star is not being eclipsed. The second feature you see is there's these bumps right here and right here, about a quarter, a little more than a quarter of the way through the orbit of the two stars and a little bit maybe the four and three quarters of the way through. And that is because of the material that the star, that the light is scattering off of. And so when you have hot things, it ionizes the gas that's around them. And so in the case of Beta Lyra, both the stars are very hot. It's ionized the gas in the disk. And when light scatters with hot ionized gas, it prefers to scatter at a 90 degree angle. And so it will scatter more light at that 90 degree angle than at 89 degrees or 91 degrees. And so when the orientation of the system, so the orientation of the primary star, which is our source of light, the disk, which is where that magic is happening in our telescope, is at a 90 degree angle, that's when we get the most polarized light coming into our telescope. And so that gives us these bumps. And then the third thing that you can see in, in the polarized light curve here is that there's a secondary eclipse and if you really look closely, that secondary eclipse is occurring just before the secondary eclipse in regular light. Right? So the secondary, and I know it's not very much, um, but this is actually pretty important. That secondary eclipse in polarized light is happening right about where the red line is, and in regular total light, it's happening where the, the blue line is. Um, so what's up with that? It's weird, right? And it turns out it's also doing this weird eclipse just before when you normally would expect it, right when all of the wiggles are doing odd things and not nice and oriented together anymore. Um, and it turns out that's a signature of something strange happening in the disk. And so normally the disk is all nice and smooth and has nice edges to it, but when you're transferring mass off of a primary star, there's a mass stream there that runs into that edge of the disk, and it's gonna screw it up, um, and it's gonna basically create like a giant splash zone and send material flying everywhere. And that's what that sig signature is. You're getting a little bit of a primary eclipse just beforehand, and then the position angle is going wonky because the structure of the disk has gone wonky. And what we call that is a hot spot because the act of material running into other material basically warms it up and it's hot. Like I said before, we're really terrible at naming things. It's a hot spot because it's hot. Um, and we can also use, uh, we can use the light curve, the polarized light curve, to basically measure the size of the hot spot. So what we just have to do to do that is go back to where this is happening, um, where the minimum in the polarized light curve is, the secondary eclipse, and just figure out what the orientation of the system was. Um, and because it's an eclipsing system, that's really easy to do. And it looks something like this. So this blue and uh, orange region is the disk, and then this red blob is the star that's losing material. And you can see it's not quite in the center. Um, if it were in the center, we would be at, at exactly secondary eclipse where the normal, where you, where you would see the normal um, minimum in total light. And um, basically, just everything in front of the in front of that star that's part of the disk that hasn't been eclipsed yet is hotspot material, um, and it's part of the disk that is just completely wonky and not nice and disk shaped anymore. Um, and so, if you actually work out the math and figure out how big that is across the face of the disk, it's actually 13 times the size of our sun. So this is really really big. We can fit 13 suns back to back to back as um, across this, um, so that's quite huge. So I hope what I've shown you is that, um, obviously polarimetry is the coolest thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay if you don't like it. It's, no, really, no, it's okay if you don't like it. Um, um, but um, importantly, if you're not doing polarimetry, you're throwing out free information about these objects, um, about whatever you're studying, uh, for no good reason, right? You're getting all of this extra information for free. I didn't have to do anything to get it except point a telescope at it um, and look at how the light was wiggling. 
And on top of that, because you're adding in this extra information, you're getting information that you're not going to get any other way. So I couldn't have gone and imaged the disk of Beta Lyra and seen that there was a hotspot on it. No matter how many giant telescopes I got, if I strung them together, I was just never going to see it. Um, I'm, it doesn't matter if I decided to look at its spectra, it's not going to happen. Um, so it's really, in my mind, it's really cool that you can basically figure out things you can see things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to see. You can see invisible things um, to you, and that gives you extra information about what's going on in different systems. So I'm happy to take questions. If you have any. You were really fast. <laughs> Oh, um, so this is, um, it's not an astronomy picture. Um, basically what somebody did was they looked at a crystal with a polarizing filter in front of their camera and different wavelengths of light um, are polarized differently and that's why you get um, this really cool color striation um, and stuff for it. Um, so, so the question was, how expensive is a polarimeter compared to a regular instrument? Um, so a polarimeter is basically a regular instrument with a couple of extra optics parts in them. So a lot of instruments can be turned into polarimeters if you have the right pieces. Um, it really depends on um, the size of the instrument and the wavelength you're at and what you're looking for. Um, for example, I was on a telecom the other day, we are talking about um, trying to revive a polarimeter that actually got put on a telescope and never used. We want to check it out and see if it's still running and working and um, if it is, commission it so that astronomers can actually use it. And somebody was telling us one of the, the pieces that we need was missing um, because they could put it in a box and put it in a room and forgotten what room they put it in at the observatory. <laughs> As one normally does with all of their important expensive equipment. Um, and so we asked for some of the specs of this piece so we could get an idea of how much money we would need if they couldn't find it and had to replace it. And it turns out that this is about $120,000 part. And so when we told them that, they said, okay, we're going to go look harder. <laughs> so it can be, they, it, they can be much more expensive. This is for an eight, uh, eight meter class telescope. Um, if a telescope um, that's maybe one meter big, you could probably build a whole perimeter for $100,000, $150,000 and not just have this one part. Uh, so the question is, how does polarized light work in radio? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know how I want to say this without making it too complex. Um, so they, they get that information for free. Basically, when they observe, they get the up and down wiggles for free, and they get the left and white wiggle wiggles for free. Um, and they can um, back out from those, what the polar, whole polarization state is. But they get it automatically with their receivers. I'm, I'm not sure if that answers We can talk about it more. Do you have office hours? <laughs> I, um, I don't have office hours because I'm not a professor, but come by and talk about it. So the question is, what else can you use the technique for to study besides massive stars? Well, Kim is going to talk to you about planets, um, so those are really hot cool. Uh, you can study magnetic fields around stars, you can study galaxies, uh, basically any astronomical object you can think of, we can, we have an application for it with Yeah, there's a skull. Ah, the question, the question is, do we know if gravity waves can be polarized in the same way? Ah, <laughs> uh, I'm going to say no, and that's a guess. I don't, I, I don't know. Um, ask the lighter folks if they come back. There's a, maybe a question way back there. Okay, last question. Like, do you do experiments here on Earth to like see how light gets polarized 
Ah, yes. So the question is, do we do experiments on Earth to see how light gets polarized as it acts with different media? Um, people do that all the time in the lab, um, and that's that happens quite often. But so I think it's time for trivia answers.
show on the road. Yes! Woo! For our last stop, you are here for tonight. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Kim Bott to tell us about the Boris Cup Experience. Oh, gee, guys. Hey! Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez, oh, right? Okay, I know you guys, most of you, are really disappointed right now because you didn't win at trivia, but it's okay because we're going to talk about aliens now, and that's good. So, specifically what we're going to talk about is how you would use polarized light to figure out if a planet is habitable, that's to say if it has conditions sort of like Earth, does it have an ocean, or whether or not a planet already has life on it, whether or not... It has biosignatures, signatures of a biome or biology, whether or not it has aliens. So the, uh, the, the first thing that we'll want to uh, cover, I'm totally blanking on my first slide. I've had three drinks, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, right, this was an introductory slide. <laughs> In case you don't know what an exoplanet is, I'm guessing most people here are science enthusiasts and you know what an exoplanet is, but just in case you don't, that's perfectly okay. An exoplanet just refers to any planets outside of our solar system. So you know that we have a star that we call the sun and the eight planets orbit around it. Well, anything that orbits around another star, and we've been finding tons of these things since the mid-90s, is an exoplanet. So when I refer to that, that's what I'm talking about. Just any planet in a solar system that's not in our own, not in our eight planets, because it was not a planet. <laughs> any other, yeah, whatever. Uh, <laughs> fight me. Uh, <laughs> so any planet in another solar system orbiting one of the stars you can see, or even the ones you can't see, is an exoplanet. And that's most of what I'll be talking about. I'll talk a little bit about ways that you could detect life on uh, bodies in our own solar system. So why would we use polarimetry in the first place to study planets? Well, we mentioned in the introduction that actually you kind of don't get polarized light from stars. If it's a star that's kind of like not being ripped apart and is very much like our sun, it's sort of main sequence, it's not too young and active or old and fluffy, then we don't get polarized light from that. So this is just an image of our own star, the sun, and, oh, and, uh, and Venus transiting in front of it. So if you want to look at something that's really freaking dim like a planet, uh, and you don't want the light from that super bright star, then you can just basically erase the star by looking at it in polarized light and study planets and life that lives on them. So there's a whole bunch of different things that you could be looking at. <laughs> what? Oh. <laughs> Good, I'm excited too. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different things that you could be looking at in polarized light. These different polarizing mechanisms. So you could be looking for the glint off of an ocean uh, for an exoplanet telling you whether or not there's an ocean there in the first place. We think we need water for life, so that's useful. We could be looking at really scattering, the same thing that makes our sky blue, we can look at on other planets and figure out what their atmospheres are like, what sort of gases are in the atmospheres. We can look for clouds and hazes uh, in some cases, and we can look for rainbows even, double rainbows. And that's a polarizing mechanism as well. Uh, and that will tell you about, obviously, what's raining down, what the precipitates are on these planets. As for actual life, there's some indication that we could look for biosignatures, so we could look at the gases in an atmosphere uh, to figure out uh, you know, whether or not there's life there, and that that might be enhanced if we look in linearly polarized light. We talked earlier about linear and circularly polarized light. With circularly polarized light, we can detect something called chiromolecules, and I will explain what that is very shortly. So, Another reason that this is a super useful thing for uh, studying planets is, I know, I know that this schematic looks way too technical. Hopefully you've also already had three drinks, so it's just too much. But, but it's, it's really quite simple. OL is just referring to the orbital longitude. It's just telling you how far on the star it 
it's gone. And uh, and the phases are just kind of like the moon, like the gibbous phase of the moon and things like that. So the other reason that this is super useful for studying planets, for studying exoplanets, is because it's dependent on the angle of the planet. So we're getting that directional information as well as the intensity, the thing we talked about in the introduction. So we can look at how the light is reflecting off or interacting with particles in the atmosphere of these planets. So here in the middle, you've got the star, and you're looking at this from a top-down angle. You would, of course, be this planet-finding satellite that's looking at it side-on. So if you're, if this is too much black and white for you, you can instead just picture that you guys are all Earthlings looking at a planet through a telescope, and that my head, my big shiny head, is a star. And then you have a planet that's orbiting around it. It's not elliptical, it's just how my hand moves. Um, but it's going around in a circular orbit. So if you're looking for something like a rainbow, you get that sort of like near full phase when it's pretty fully illuminated and the planet's kind of behind my head or behind the star. And then if you're looking for something like really scattering that's producing that blue light in our sky and our red sunsets, that's hitting a maximum in that polarized light when it's at 90 degrees. So that's important. You can tell the difference looking at polarized light by seeing whether you get a peak when the planet's back here or when it's at the side. You can tell whether that's from a rainbow or if it's from the really scattering. And then if you're looking at something like the water reflection, that glint, that glare off the ocean, uh, you can get that when the planet is closer to a crescent phase. So when the planet has moved in front of the star, you don't get a whole lot of polarized light when it's directly in front of the star, but kind of out here you'll get a glint, you'll get this kind of glimmer off the surface if the planet has an ocean. Now, I want to do a quick aside. This Cool. We're talking about uh, astrobiology in terms of life as we know it. And that's done for a very practical reason. We need to have very detailed ideas about what we're looking for. So when I'm talking about this, I'm aware of the fact that I'm talking about looking for plants with water, oceans, H2O, oceans. And scientists do know that you can have life that's a sentient ocean that Make, takes the form of your dead ex-wife and tries to kill everyone on the spaceship. But the kind of life that we can look for would be something more akin to what we see on Earth. So there's sort of three things that you can look for uh, that you can look for uh, when you're looking at polarized light of a planet, when you're doing planetary polarimetry. You can try to characterize the system uh, just to figure out what the atmosphere is like, what the orbit is like. You can try to judge habitability. Does it have an ocean? Does it have an atmosphere like ours? What is the rain like there? Is it something I would want to be standing in? And you can try to detect biosignatures, those signatures of a biome, signatures of biology, that there's life already there. So when we're talking about characterizing planets, we can actually do that whether or not the planet is small or large. We only expect life to be on small planets, but we can kind of practice polarimetry with really large planets, even with Jupiter-sized planets. Uh, so we have these things called hot Jupiters you might have heard of, and they're like the size of Jupiter or larger, and then they're like a fraction of the distance that Mercury is to our own sun. They can orbit within like an Earth day, so their, their year is like less than an Earth day. And so they're super hot. They're getting tons of radiation from their star, lots of light bouncing off of them, and they're also very large, so they're really good at reflecting light. And that gives us something to study in the meantime. It was only very recently that we developed uh, polarimeters, things that could measure polarized light, that were sensitive enough to start studying planets. So these are sort of the first things that we've begun to look at. And, oh, there's some math there. Let's get rid of that. Let's go. <laughs> so, so when you're looking to just kind of characterize a planet, you're maybe looking for that 
Rayleigh scattering like we see in our own atmosphere. So to look for Rayleigh scattering, you're just kind of looking for this wiggle. You're looking for that peak or maybe a dip, because it can be positive or negative, when the planet is in behind, or sorry, at 90 degrees, more or less, you get the peak in polarized light for Rayleigh scattering. And you can do that with those giant planets. Unfortunately, so far, we have, we have started looking, there's only really a couple polarimeters that can even do this in the world, but we've started looking at this, and we just kind of see, this is kind of one of the better cases, and we just see scatter. So you can kind of fit that, that wave to it, but it doesn't fit very well. So we think maybe we're seeing that, but this is a totally new application of polarimetry. It's kind of exciting. It's really, really new. We're figuring out all the different things that we need to look at when we look at a planet to be sure that we're just getting the polarized light from the planet itself. So this is an example of a hot Jupiter, real data from a hot Jupiter there, um, uh, and with uh, measurements meant to detect the, the Rayleigh scattering from the atmosphere to see whether or not it has a blue atmosphere. The reason you might care about whether or not planets have blue atmospheres and what the Rayleigh scattering is like is because it tells you something about the average size of the particles in the atmosphere. So we have a lot of nitrogen and some oxygen in our atmosphere, and we have uh, a different sunset than what you might expect on different planets. We have a blue sky that's produced by the Rayleigh scattering as well as our red sunsets, and that's going to vary from planet to planet. So looking at the Rayleigh scattering and polarized light, a really easy way, relatively, to detect uh, Rayleigh scattering because you're nulling the star, you don't get any light from the star, would tell us something about what the, the bulk composition uh, of the atmosphere is, what it's like in general. So we can move on from giant planets and sort of looking at the atmospheres and try to start judging habitability. Does this planet have gases in its atmosphere that are a similar composition to ours? Does it have an ocean that produces glint? Does it have rainbows that are actual rain and like made of water and not like sulfuric acid or something we don't want to be standing in? Oh, I'm sorry. We'll get rid of that again. So, <laughs> I'm going to take care of that, don't worry. Um, so, if we're looking at something like rainbows, the reason that looking for rainbows works is. Not only do you get a peak in the rainbow at a certain uh, point in the orbit, but that peak will change very slightly depending what that rain, what the cloud that's producing the rainbow is made out of. So if you have water, you'll get that peak in your polarized light at a slightly different angle from if you have, say, raindrops made out of sulfuric acid, like on Venus, or if you have raindrops made out of methane, like on Titan. And that's all due to that math that I just covered up, but basically all that math was saying was that the light will bend in the, uh, in the water droplets at a slightly different angle depending what the droplet is made out of. If it's water, it bends at a slightly different angle than if it's methane. And we all know that there, or probably told at some point in our life that rainbows happen at a very specific angle. And so when we're looking at polarized light, we're just extending that to exoplanets that could have rainbows happening at slightly different angles, at different points in their orbits. So part, one of the teams that I work with has used models to reproduce this for a very famous case of Venus. Back in the day, way back in the day, people were like, oh, Venus, it's around the same size as Earth. It's probably pretty nice there. It's probably got tropical jungles. It's a little warmer. It's closer to the star, uh, to our sun. I'm sure it's great. And then looking, <laughs> looking at more and more detail about the information, the light that we were getting from the atmosphere of Venus, and looking, in fact, at the polarized light, at different wavelengths, we were able, I keep almost flipping, uh, we were able to tell what its rainbow was like. So you can look in sort of like a red light, a green light, a blue light, 
and look for those peaks in the polarized light, that rainbow, sort of like what I showed you on the last slide, and compare them. And you can tell where your rainbow is happening and sort of how spread out the colors are, what shape the rainbow has. And that's going to tell you whether or not those rain droplets are made out of water like we have on Earth or sulfuric acid like we have on Venus. And maybe we don't want to go there after all. That was a bad idea. <laughs> So we're trying to create these really robust models that will take into consideration um, polarized light from relay scattering in the atmosphere as well as from uh, rainbows. And if you had a planet where you could see the surface, not like Venus, um, you'd be able to see the signature from glints as well. Um, and we're able to kind of map the polarized light signature that we get across the surface. So this is sort of looking at Venus through different phases, and then those blue dashes that don't show terribly well on the screen are those different polarized light vectors. So they're little lines telling you how that light is aligned. So it's giving you the directional information as well as the intensity. And then if you were able to look at a planet through different phases, you'd be able to tell things like if it had uh, an atmosphere made out of nitrogen and oxygen or carbon dioxide and whether or not it had raindrops made from water or made from sulfuric acid. So speaking of looking at planets through phases, another detect way to detect habitability or to judge habitability is to look for glint. So this is a real planet called Earth. <laughs> I know, this is real observations of a, of a planet. Um, and so you can kind of see the, the light from the sun kind of bouncing back as it moves across. And you can see a peak in that, uh, in that light right when it's kind of at crescent. So I said you would see the peak in, uh, in glint when the planet's kind of in front of you, kind of in front of my head. Um, when it would look like a crescent to you. And that's when you're going to see that peak in polarized light. So we can look for that as well, as well as the rainbow and the relay scattering. We can start to get a really robust picture of what the planet is like. Of course, in reality, we have all these other things going on. We have clouds that are getting in the way, and we have continents, which I guess are good. But you can start, ideally, you can start mapping right? You could look at when you see the glint and when you don't see the glint and get an idea of maybe where the continents lie. And that might give you an idea of the plate tectonics and some other things that we want to know to get an idea of whether or not a planet is habitable. You can also figure out whether or not, oh, um, whether or not those oceans that are producing the glint are something nice like water that we think life as we know it would be happy in or something uh, a little different that maybe other life would be happy in or maybe life wouldn't be happy in at all. And once again, that's all to do with math, but it all comes down to the fact that different things bend light at different angles. So glass bends light at a different angle than water. And similarly, on Earth we have light going from air, uh, bouncing off of H2O water, and that's going to produce a maximum and polarized light at a different angle than on